I've heard people say that there's, there's no safer place to be than the hands of God. And, and sometimes they mean that in a way of like it's, it's a way to prosper, it's a way to gain. But really, during hard times, there's no safer or better place to be than the hands of God when we're grieving, when we're hurting. Amen. Amen. That's a beautiful psalm. Thank you. <clears throat> if you will, take your Bible and turn to Colossians. <clears throat> be hitting a, a couple of chapters when I, when I highlight some of the some of the, the verses in, in the first couple of three chapters of Colossians. I want you to know that some of you may be familiar with this teaching from me. Um, this is something that's on my heart a lot lately. Uh, as, as I've encountered different people at my work, as I've encountered different Christians in their walk, as I've seen on YouTube the different presentations about people and what they believe about Jesus. Um, <clears throat> so I want you to know if you guys, have, if, if anybody I've taught or talked about before, it's because it's a very real concern of mine, and it's a very real concern for the church at large, for the body of Christ. So, <clears throat> I want to cover it again, and, and I want us to let it sink in the impact of what we'd like to talk about today. I remember the first vacation Carol and I took as a married couple. We started in Michigan. We see a friend of mine get married up there in Manistee, Michigan, and we spent the remainder of our vacation in Statesville, North Carolina. It's a happening place. Uh, we went to see her older sister and her family. Now, as we began to leave, her sister gave us directions about which exit to take and what manner to get on. Uh, and we said our goodbyes and went on our way. <clears throat> and started what was supposed to be about another five hour drive uh, to take us back to Chattanooga. Now, Carol and I had been to her sister's house before, and we already knew the way, so we anticipated a very uneventful trip back home. <coughs> Excuse me. About two hours into our drive, however, we knew something was wrong. The landscape was not the same as in times past. We were seeing signs for cities we had never encountered, and the mountains that we were expected to be in, at, allowing for the time we had already driven, were nowhere in sight. And so we know there's supposed to be out there, there's no mountains. It's a little scary. <laughs> so, <laughs> after two hours of driving back home, we realized we were not driving back home at all. <clears throat> uh, uh, we were going the way. Uh, we were heading for the coast of North Carolina, which is not really bad on the nice. uh, As we started to rethink what went wrong and finally used the atlas uh, that had been with us the whole time, we, we were able to pinpoint the error that led to our unplanned detour. It was misinformation. Her sister, <clears throat> instead of telling us to get on I 40 West, told us to get on I 40 East. And, and despite having driven there and back before and knowing the right way, we just mindlessly took the exit she told us, and we took. Uh, uh, we didn't question the, the east versus west idea because I thought only goes one way. It goes from the coast, it goes all the way through North Carolina, westward. And we never questioned the idea. We didn't notice the city of Winston Salem that we drove right through. We didn't notice the city of Greensboro that we drove right through. Uh, <laughs> Neither of which we had encountered before ever in our lives. Um, we just drove hoping to get where we were supposed to be. And I think it was around was signs for Raleigh that we started to suspect, oh, hold on. This is, uh, I, I'm not supposed to go to Raleigh. <laughs> so, <clears throat> now, we were able to laugh at this because about the end of the day, we would have lost about four hours of time. Uh, but giving you wrong information is a, it's a very serious matter. Right. It's a very serious matter. When I give medicine to my children, it's important that the information on that label is correct. If we want to try to save, one, save someone's life using CPR, it's vitally important to us and to them that we have been taught correctly. Right. Living the Christian life is no different. As a matter of fact, it's more important. It's eternal. Amen. To live lives that honor God, we must know something about God. Right. Before we go any further, I want us to understand this principle. What we know informs how we live. Right. What we know informs how we live. So that equals what we know about Christ informs how we are to live for Christ. Amen. What we know about Christ informs how we ought to live for Christ. And we want to know that the information we have been given and are basing our walks on is true. Right. And this was the problem with the Church of Colossae. The church was being given misinformation about who Christ was. And this was affecting the way they lived their lives. An early form of what would later be called Gnosticism in the third and the fourth centuries was slowly creeping into the church. 
Now, to put it simply, this is what it was doing. <clears throat> Gnosticism boiled down was this. Couldn't know who really God was. Didn't know how he created the world, but the loving and perfect God could create such a bad world. They didn't think that that could happen, so they started to say different things about who God was. They formed their own theology about God, decided that, there, that the real God was somewhere out there, and God had to the human world, and that what created the world was, in fact, emanations of God. Spirit beings. <clears throat> They couldn't really talk to God. Now, how this played into the church was this. It was denied in Christ's deity in bodily form. We call the Gnostics we deny. They would say that matter is entirely evil, the physical. Anything physical, our bodies, things that we do, that's all entirely evil. So they would deny Christ's deity in bodily form. And because of this, this was, they were adding works to attain salvation. They, they believed in mystical knowledge of the enlightened few. They believed in the observance of rituals and a rigorous asceticism, almost like a monk-like lifestyle. And also, there were other beings other than Christ that could mediate between us and God. So the, the, their former teaching was that, first and foremost, can't really know who God is, can't really be in contact with God. And because we believe what we believe about matter, about the earth being so evil, Christ can't be a human, physical being. He can't really be deity, because that, 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 that goes wrong with what the word of the Lord is. So let's think about, let's rethink Christ. And from, and from rethinking Christ, all of the other things flow. Because they didn't have a, a, a view of Christ that was true, they started believing that they could, well, if we, if we, if we live our lives in such a way, this way, this way, minding our feet and cues, denying ourselves physical pleasures. I mean, you had, you had people that in that culture and time uh, would go, uh, go without certain things that were needed for that culture. They would not have went through Kapluva, which in the temperature and the climate was needed. They would not marry that was a physical pleasure. They would have children out of, out of basically obedience to having to have children, having to, to appropriate. They would, out of necessity, they, they would not engage in real marriage. Um, they, they believed that, like, due to holding to certain Jewish rituals and certain Jewish customs, would somehow garner them enough merit with the God that's out there so they could attain whatever salvation was meant for them. And honestly, they really didn't know. Gnosticism was never a real formal, even when it started to, to, to come to the forefront of the second, the fourth, and the third, the, the second, third, and fourth centuries, never really had a formalized teaching. You couldn't go to a theological school for Gnosticism. You had ideas, and those ideas were there were spring movements and other ideas. And so they could never really know about who God it was. And they couldn't really know if they had ever garnered enough merit to attain salvation. So they also believed in mediators. They believed in these spirit beings that emanated from God that they could they could talk to. That could help them on their way. And they would only talk to a certain few. There were only a, a certain few within the, like in this body here, there would only be like 10 that could talk to these mediators. So you have these 10 people ruling this church, or ruling this body of believers, and, 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 and imposing upon them rituals, observance of, of certain days for, for holy days, uh, things that they couldn't eat, things that they couldn't touch, and things like that. It's all for the sake of holiness and righteousness that they hoped get them salvation. <clears throat> that they hope for getting salvation. Um, so having this information, the Colossians ordered their lives in a manner that did not glorify God. They did not grow them up spiritually and did not exalt Christ. But they started with. They started with Christ. They were operating in a fall. Now believe it or not, this can and does happen in the church today. People who start off in Christ just like I and Carol, we started off, we knew how to get where we were going. We started the right thing um, when we came down there. People who start off in Christ are misled as to who Christ is and what they have to do to please Him and earn a favor from God. Some churches, now this is today, some churches teach that Christ isn't truly God. Others teach that Christ is Satan and brothers. Some say that Christ didn't finish the work of salvation, so there's something that has to be added to it. Others will add rules to please God and judge others by. Now we have churches that will say that no one can be sure about anything, so let's just muddle through together. Then there are people, a lot of people, some who don't go to church, and some who have ridden the pew their whole life that customize Jesus the way they believe hard. And they all
Now, the Apostle Paul wanted to clear that fog and send the Colossian church back to the truth, with the result being that as the fog was lifted, they could, they could so fashion their lives so as to glorify Christ. <clears throat> this is God's desire for the church today. He wants us, uh, he wants us to understand who Christ is and, and, and who we are in Christ, and with this correct information, so order our steps, so, so live in a life that Christ is honored, that he's magnified. Now here in the letter of Colossians, we have the person of Christ being exalted, being taught by Paul. We have our position in Christ, and we have our parents in Christ. I want you to understand that this, the reason why this is important to me is because I see this happening. I, I was on YouTube just the other day, and there was a 30-minute message by someone who talked about water baptism. And this wasn't a typical Church of Christ person who believed that water, they believed that water baptism was essential for salvation. This was another kind of church. And, 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 and they're the ones, they don't believe that Christ finished the work of, of salvation on the cross. They believe that something has to be added to it. Some people that are around today, churches that are around today, don't believe that, that Christ was actually God the whole time, that he only had the deity imparted to him while he was here on earth. And to me, the worst right now is the customized Christ. Christ is what I think that he is. Because there's, there's no bearing about how to find out or, 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 or judge what the person is saying is true or not. People, I remember talking and walking with, or working with a girl who said, oh, I love my Jesus. She, she was saying that in a, in a very fun way. But, and and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, do you really know who Jesus is? Because your life doesn't reflect it. You have ideas about Jesus. Look, he's your big buddy. He's your bro. He's going to do what you want to do. But you, you have to guard the fact that he's the only God who came out of heaven to earth. To die for your sins, you don't know that. He's just your buddy, and you really don't know who he is. And so they order their lives by that, by this customized Christ, never knowing who he is. And Christians do that. Right. Who start with Christ, the way the Colossian church did. They start with Christ, but somewhere along the way they start to customize their own Christ. Despite now, I believe this church teaches Christ. And you believe our pastors have done that and done a good job of that. Amen. But you know what? Even in churches that preach the right thing, there are people who will be in the pews, and in their minds, something different comes in. Right. And maybe it's because they want it that way or not. I don't know. But in their minds, they see Jesus a different way. Right. They see Jesus a different way. And this is what we want to confront, because all we have to tell us who Christ is is his word. Sure. That's all we have. There are no other books that really explain Jesus. You can look at the works of antiquity and history. They're, they're, this is it. This is the information that we have. This is our source of authority. And this is what Paul was using to tell, or this is not, this is, as Paul was writing, this is what he was saying to the church of philosophy. So let's look at this to see the person of Christ, our position in Christ, and our imperatives in Christ. First, the person of Christ, from chapter 22. First, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. Look at verse 15 of chapter 1. We'll look at 14 for context, so you make sure that you know he's talking about Christ here. Okay, look at verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us to the kingdom of his dear Son, that's Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And this is still talking about Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. The exact representation and manifestation of the Father is in Christ. In John 14, 8 and 9, of course, Jesus' his own words. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Suffice us. Suffice us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Jesus is the exact representation, manifestation in of the Father. So if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. The Greek word translated image is icon. It does not apply a weakening or a feeble copy of something. It implies the illumination of its inner core and essence. To call Christ the image of God is to say that in him, the being and nature of God have been perfectly manifested. That in him, the invisible has become visible. That the invisible God that people worship and didn't know is now present and visible. And you can see him. If you see Christ, you've seen God the Father. He's an exact representation of that which is invisible, the unseen God. Now, people worship is now seen. Paul's saying, and this is, this is to counter what the Gnostics say, that Christ couldn't be fleshy. He's saying, no, in the very physical person of Christ was God the Father. Right. He's not off in the corner of the universe somewhere. He is right here. 
the invisible God. Secondly, he is the creator of all things, and in him all things are held together. Verse 16 and 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and all things are being held together. The law of gravity that we really appreciate. That's, that's an, out, an outworking of Christ's power, of his knowledge. All things hold together in him. He is the agent of all creation, and all creation was made for him. And the order of the universe and system is an expression. It's an expression of his mind, as opposed to chaos. I said that the law of gravity that we enjoy, the other laws that we enjoy, of the, physical, the physical science that we study, all of these are an expression of his mind. The way that we think that everything should be spinning out of control, and it's not our expression of his mind. Dr. Constable wrote this. Several steps are involved in the construction of a substantial building. First, an architect has obtained, has obtained to design the building and prepare plans, specifications, in accordance with the expressed desires of the owner. Then the plans are submitted for bids by builders or contractors, and a builder is secured. After the completion of the edifice, it is occupied by the owner and devoted to its intended use. Our Lord is not only the builder of the universe, he is also its architect and owner. All things have been created in him, the eternal plans for the creation abide in him. By him, he acted as the builder, and for him, the creation belongs to him and is to reflect his glory. For centuries, the Greek philosophers had taught that everything needed a primary cause, an instrumental cause and a final cause. The primary cause is the plan, the instrumental cause is the power, and the final cause is the purpose. When it comes to creation, Jesus Christ is the primary cause because he planned it. He is the instrumental cause because he produced it. And he is the final cause because he did it for his own good pleasure. Not only is he the image of the invisible God, he is also the creator and the sustainer of the universe that we live in. So, so God's not off in the galaxy by himself, letting the spiritual emanations from him create the universe. It's saying that the very real God was visible right here. He is the same one that created this world and by him, the world holds together. Even now, that's why we're not off flying away. It's an expression of his mind. While Christ was here on earth, the universe was being held as an expression of his mind. Why? Because he's the exact representation and manifestation of the Father. He is God. Mm -hmm. Third, he is the head of the body, the church. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. He himself is the originator and the head of the body. He is the one who started the church. He is the firstborn from the dead in the church. He is a sovereign because he is the firstborn from the dead. Christ is the beginning of the church in that he is its power and source of spiritual life. Christ was the first person to rise from the dead with a glorified body, never to die again. Others have been raised from the dead. We see Lazarus and others have been raised from the dead. Christ is the only one to rise from the dead with a glorified body to never die again. He broke death's hold on humanity. Thus Christ became preeminent also in the new creation, the church, as well as in the old creation. He's the head of the body. He is our source of strength and spirituality. He is what we would call our life's blood. Head of the body of the church. Fourthly, in him the Father dwells in bodily form. We'll look at verse 19 of chapter 1 and verse 9 of chapter 2. But in him all fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And this is one of the biggest arguments that you can't really know that God is physical. Christ is saying, well, yes, he is. Look at this in verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. The totality of the divine powers and attributes dwelt in Christ permanently. Kenneth Weiss, Kenneth Weiss, who was a Greek grammarian, wrote this um, about the word <clears throat> to dwell. And in the Greek is katoiko, or katoikeo. Uh, katoikeo used here speaks of the fact that all the divine fullness is at home permanently in the Lord Jesus. At home in the sense that his divine fullness was not something added to his being that was not natural to him. See, like, like again, there's some churches out there today that believe that Christ wasn't always God. 
he was born man. That later, the, the deity, I guess, was poured into him somehow. But here it's saying that as Christ was born, he was already deity. That deity, all the fullness of what God is, was always him at, at home permanently. It's not like it was poured into something. It was poured in substance. Amen. But that it was part of his essential being, as part of his very constitution, and it was permanent. And, and he also writes, because in him there is continuously and permanently at home all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily fashion. Look at verse 9 of chapter 2. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is saying that there never was a time when Jesus Christ was on earth that he wasn't God. Amen. It was never at him. There was a controversy back in, I think, uh, 500 AD. The Arian controversy was the night Christ did. Arius believed that there was a he wasn't always eternal, but he didn't always exist. And as he was born into the world, that's what happened. One man named Athanasius stood against that. He believed that Christ was always God. And at one point in time, a lot of people disagreed with Athanasius. And one of his assistants told him, Athanasius, all of Rome is against you. And you know what Athanasius said? Then I am against all of Rome. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus Christ has always been God. And he is Physically God on the earth. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in human bodily form. There right. never was a time when Christ was not. Never was a time when Christ was not. Amen. Christ always has been. And when he came to earth, he poured himself into the human, into the human body. And there you have this, this union of deity and humanity that can never be separated. Can never be separated. In him the Father dwells in bodily form, in him the fullness of deity dwells. Bodily, permanently. This is who Christ is. Last but not least, the person of Christ. It is in Him that we have redemption, forgiveness of sins, peace, and reconciliation. This is what we start with in Christ. Look at that 114. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Saying, in Him we have been paid for. That's what redemption means. And, and, and Paul is, is using the idea of the slave market saying, we've been bought out of that. Christ paid that. He paid that so he could forgive us. And the word for forgiveness is this beautiful picture of sending something away. Just like the scapegoat in Israel's history. They would sacrifice one and, put the, and, and lay the sins of, of the nation on the other. And what would they do? They would send it to the wilderness, never be seen from again. And the picture of forgiveness that Paul is writing here, the word used, is saying that when God forgave his sins, he was saying, go. Never be seen again. Never be seen again. In him we have been bought and paid for. In him we have forgiveness of sins that we never see again. Why? Because when God sent those things away, what do you do to a dog you want to get rid of? You throw rocks at it. <laughs> <laughs> he forgave our sins in such a way those sins don't come back. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. He said, shoot. Get out of here. Exactly what they did to the government. They sent off the living world. It's never be seen from again. Get it. It's over. It's gone. When he forgave, he forgave. He never hung it over our heads. Do you remember that time? I know I forgave you. Do you remember that time when you did this? It doesn't happen in Christ. In him we have redemption. In him we have been all paid for out of that slave work of sin. You know what that means for us? That means that we're not slaves to sin. We don't have to see it. Right. We've been freed. Amen. And then we also have peace and reconciliation. Look at verses 20, 21, and 22. I read verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things with himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh, meaning he physically lived and he physically died for our sins. In the body of his flesh, through death, present you holy and unblameable and unapprovable in his sight. In him we have peace with God. In him, the relationship that was torn asunder by man with God has been reconciled, has been changed. For 
we can be in fellowship with him again. Basically, what it's saying here, when it says in verse 22, in the body of this flesh through, the, through death, to present you a holy and unbelievable and unreprovable witness of meaning, the work of salvation was done, and it was done by Christ, and it was brought to completion by him. You don't get to say that you have part in salvation. Thanks be to God, we don't have to say that. Because if I had, to, if I had to, to work for it myself, I would never make it. Right. How many of you can agree with me that even though you want to live a holy life, a righteous life, one that admits Christ, when you wake up in the morning, five minutes after you woke up, you usually mess that up. Right. I got one hand, I got two, I got three, I got four. <laughs> Understanding that it only took one sin to sever that relationship with the Father. And understanding that we have a multitude of sins that we would try and have to work our way out of. Salvation is impossible for us. Salvation is impossible for us. Despite what Gnostics would have them believe, despite what the Jewish rituals and, and, the, and the cleansing and the, and the asceticism and the monastic lifestyle, despite all of that, they would come to God on their deathbed with dirty, filthy rags. Thinking they had salvation. All the while they had diminished Christ and what he did and who he was. Right. But the lost church really didn't mean, didn't mean they lost their salvation. If you start with Christ, because Christ is the author and finisher of faith, you end with Christ. Despite how much muddling you get along the way. So the Colossian church started with Christ, but somewhere along the way, something creeped in. And they were starting to follow all these rituals, starting to do all these things, starting to observe all these things, starting to, you know, hit themselves with planks. Sorry, to do all these things that, with, that, that really were not glorifying God. They were hurting them, they were getting them nowhere. No rewards in heaven. No joy of fellowship with God and other believers. Why? I think Martin Luther's life before he discovered grace kind of pictures it best. Martin Luther was the, the priest who kind of inspired the Reformation in 1517. And before he actually started in God's Word, he, he had a real hard time dealing with his sins. He did not feel worthy to do anything in ministry. His sin plagued his mind. And he would crawl on his knees. And I think he actually did this in Rome. He crawled on his hands, on his elbows, on his knees, up the steps. Thinking he was on a religious pilgrimage that would garner him some kind of mirror from God to help him on his way to salvation. And he thinks this is simple. Salvation about God's grace through faith in Christ. But the Colossian church who started in Christ were falling away from that. And they would not lose their salvation, but they would lose reward, they would lose fellowship, they would lose joy, they would lose the security they had in their mind. And how can you better be secure? Or feel secure if all you're doing every day seems to mess you up even more. It's like you're digging for gold. And you keep digging right here and dumping dirt. And every knowing that there was this big, huge gold vein right behind you, and all you're doing is throwing the dirt on you. And you're burying it. You're never going to get to. That's what happened to By diminishing you, Christ was. Who Christ is. So here Paul says, Christ is the image of the invisible God. He's the creator and the sustainer of all things, and all things hold together. He's the author, he's the finisher of our faith. And so, with this, we look at our position in Christ. Who are we in Christ? Chapter 3 says this, if, then, if ye then be risen with Christ, and that's not if you have, I don't know, maybe so, it's saying, understand when you've been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What are we? We are raised up with Christ spiritually. We were dead spiritually in our sin. When we trusted Christ, then just as God raised him up physically, he raised us up spiritually. So we were made alive again. We were dead men walking with the Lord. Now, Pastor still made mention of this at the Sunday service that we were, we were, we were walking. Walking dead, living in the world of dead. We didn't even know it. But when we trusted in Christ, we became alive. In Christ, we also died. 
You died in Christ spiritually. As we were raised to new life spiritually, we also died spiritually. Uh, Kenneth Beach writes this, that we were separated to the former life and everything of an evil nature that pertained to it. I mean, we died to sin. We died to sin. We've been raised to love, newness of life in Christ, but we also died to sin, so we don't have to be sinners anymore. We don't have to have that chain. Have a way of escape. If we so desire what God would have for us, we can escape sin. Your life has been hidden in Christ. Your life has been hidden in Christ. Dr. H. E. Robertson wrote this. So here we are in Christ, who is God. And no burglar, not even Satan himself, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Our salvation is secure because the life that we've been raised to is hidden in heaven with Christ. We are secure in our salvation. And I remember growing up when I would get scared. Especially, I remember playing baseball. I hated people pitching at me. I hated fast pitch baseball. I hated The idea that another kid my age had the control <laughs> to pitch the ball over the plate, not being me, I just didn't. I couldn't see it happen. So I was scared. So I did what every kid does that's scared to hit. What does he do? When, when the pitch is thrown, he takes a step towards third base and says, What does he do? All the time. I would say, How that's bad. And I leaned. You'd almost think the guy was shaving as much exaggerated as I was. I was leaning back. Like the, that movie The Matrix for the younger people who know The Matrix. I was leaning, I was leaning back. My dad comes along, and my brother's a pitcher. He's a little lefty. My dad says, Son, Sam, right here in the bathroom. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear, for 
we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And we shall see him as he is. When Christ comes back, we are going to be like him. We are going to be like him. We will appear, we'll appear with him in glory. Now, we've seen the person of Christ. We've seen our position in Christ. There are a couple of imperatives in Christ. And I want to look again at 1 John just real quick, because I think it says it really well. <clears throat> if I can find it. I have it. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1 of Colossians. It says, if, then, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek him. Seek those things which are above where Christ is. As he said at the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above, not on the things of earth. To seek those things which are above constantly. Set your affection on those things above. And it's kind of two sides of the same point. One is a practical be seeking those things which are above, and then setting your mind on those things. It means set your affection and your heart on those things. Not on things below. Constantly be setting your mind and your affection on things above where Christ is. Where we wrote this, our feet must be on earth, but our minds must be in heaven. It means the practical everyday affairs, everyday affairs of life get their direction from Christ in heaven. It means further that we look at earth from heaven's point of view. So it says, seek ye. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is in the right hand of God, and set your affection on those things above, not on the things on earth. Chapter 3 begins Paul's practical application of the truth he taught, chapters 1 and 2, about who Christ is and our position in Christ, things that we don't have to do anymore because we're in Christ. And now he's saying, this is what I want you to do because you have been risen with Christ. And every one of us, I hope, has been risen with Christ. We have been saved. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is on the right hand of God. Set your affection on those things that are above and not on the things of earth. Set your heart and your mind on the things which don't pass away, not on the things down here that do pass away. Look at life. Go about living that way. The one again is the, the application of the, the putting the shoe leather to the ground there. The, the rubber to the rubber. Living your life, seeking those things which are above where Christ is. And setting your mind and your heart right there with him. Why? Because he will be back. Because he will be back. So we have the person of Christ, our position in Christ, and the appearance of Christ. If Christ is who he said he is, if he is who Paul claimed to be, who he claimed to be. And if he's done it in our lives, when he says he's done, then we need to set our minds, our hearts, on those things which are above. This means that, again, certain things can fall by the wayside. Certain, certain things can be put in place of God and be taken down. Those are temporary. They don't, they don't last. Our priorities basically have to change. Why? Because, because Christ is who he said he was. And because Christ did do in you what he said he was going to do. Because we have a position in him that demands it to set our thing, set our mind on things above. Be about your father's business. Don't think about this world as being eternity. This world's going to pass. Right. Live for him who died for you. Amen. Now, I want to ask. Uh, Winford and Stan and Miss Marie and a couple of others to kind of stand up and, 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 and they know that this as I want to invitation you know if there are any business here that didn't want to raise your hands earlier these are people who you want to talk to um, I want to stand uh, my wife and I were giving misinformation and it costs us being informed correctly. 
I can vouch for the church and his pastors and teaching that Christ is taught, is, is, is rightly taught. Uh, but if you've been rightly pew much of your life and customizing your own Christ, despite what's being taught, then you don't know Christ. And maybe you're here and you never trusted Christ. And the people I've just mentioned are people who've been taught to. I don't want the guys that love to play. I don't, I don't have a super invitation because it is all folks here. So this is the time for us to, to reflect and think. Well, I know and I believe that Christ is who He said He is. He's, he's in Him well as the fullness of the, of the God. There's no of God and all His form in Him. We have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Is, is He this to you? Or have you customized your own Christ? Does Christ play the beat to your drum? Do you play the beat to his drum? I want us to think about these things and reflect. And if you want to, you come and and you get it right. And you just tell them, and I have to live like I know who you are. And my life is a reflection of that. I hope I want to live like someone who knows who you are and do my own in you. And I want to set my own things above. And again, if you haven't trusted in Christ, this is the time to do so. Because you've just been taught who Christ is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Yeah. 